Storm on the Island by Seamus Heaney is set in the Arran Islands, a group of three islands on the west coast of Ireland. The narrator of the poem begins by describing how well prepared he and others are for a coming storm. They've built their houses short and wide to withstand the powerful wind. They've laid firm foundations and built strong roofs. There's no threat of losing crops they've grown because the earth is so dry that they've never been able to farm in the first place. There aren't any trees either. If there had been trees, they would have kept the islanders company during the storm because of the sounds that are made as the wind blasts through branches and leaves. These sounds allow you to listen to what you're afraid of and to forget that the storm is attacking your house. As the poem progresses and the storm begins, this confidence begins to disappear. The narrator becomes more and more desperate and afraid. Let me just point out, this video is a quick recap of the poem. To learn more, watch my full analysis, which I'll link at the end. Seamus Heaney was born in 1939 and died in 2013. He was a Northern Irish poet, playwright and translator. His early poetry, which includes Storm on the Island, often focused on rural life and matters of identity and ancestry. In terms of the power and conflict cluster, one way to view Storm on the Island is as a poem about the uncontrollable power of nature. Heaney uses language and structure to present this power. To begin, the poem consists of one continuous stanza, made up of many long and complex sentences. Read the poem aloud and you'll realise there's not much room to stop for breath as it progresses. Both the lack of stanza breaks and the long sentences symbolise the overwhelming power of nature. Similarly, the poem contains enjambment, where the sentences run over into separate lines. We see one example here on screen, where a single sentence spans six lines. Heaney's use of enjambment, like the use of one long stanza, creates a constant barrage of information, reflecting the constant barrage of the storm on the house. Heaney uses the language of conflict to represent the power of nature. We've got blasts, pummels, exploding, bombarded, strafes and salvo. Now this language points to a secondary meaning to the poem, which I'll come back to in a minute, but in terms of the power of nature, the storm is described with the language of conflict to suggest that it is dangerous and threatening. In the midst of this presentation of nature as powerful, Heaney uses everyday language such as, you know what I mean. This contrast between the language of conflict and the language of everyday life seems oxymoronic, but perhaps it is used simply to suggest that this is everyday life to the narrator, as awful as that sounds. This is further demonstrated when Heaney uses the oxymoron exploding comfortably. These two words don't seem to make sense together, but they reflect how the speaker has made sense of the storm-filled world he lives in, even if it might not make sense to us. This idea of the storm being nothing new for the narrator is also reflected in the poem's rhyme scheme. The poem contains very little in the way of rhyme, its lack of control reflecting, once again, the uncontrollable storm. However, there is half rhyme in the opening and closing couplets. Consider the opening couplet. Here we see an example of half rhyme. Half rhyme is where the stressed syllables of the end of consonants rhyme, but the vowel sounds before them do not. Let's look at squat and slate. The final consonant sound, the t sound, is the same, so there is some rhyme taking place, but the vowel sound before is wa in squat and the a sound in slate. That's a half rhyme. And we see the same in the final two lines of the poem. Look at air and fear. Both have the same consonant sound at the end, the r sound. But the vowel sounds are air and e. The use of half rhyme symbolises how the wild storm refuses order and control. Heaney knew that full rhyme would have been too perfect, too obviously different to the rest of the poem. Too perfect for a representation of the chaos of a storm. But the bigger question is why have any rhyme at all? And the answer lies in where the rhyme occurs, at the start, in the opening two lines, and at the end, in the final two lines. In rhyme pattern, then, the poem ends as it begins, with a half rhyme, and this gives the poem a cyclical structure, creating a sense that the storm is inescapable and will continue to occur time and time again. Now a second way to read Storm on the Island is as a poem about the conflict in Ireland, which I go through in my full analysis linked at the end. Not everyone sees the poem that way, but why not watch the video and draw your own conclusions? So in terms of power and conflict, if we see this as a poem about the power of nature, you might compare Storm on the Island with Extract from the Prelude, Kamikaze and Exposure. 
But which other poems would you compare it with and why? Put your comments in the comments section. For more on this poem, pick up a copy of Mr. Bruff's Guide to Power and Conflict Poetry, available exclusively in ebook form at mrbruff.com and linked in the description. If you like this shorter style of analysis video, do give it a thumbs up and I'll make some more. But remember, this video isn't intended to tell you everything you need to know about the poem. It's a recap for revision purposes. For the full lesson, check out the video linked here on screen.